Get straight into it. Keith Scotland, attorney at law, is here, and we are speaking to the independence of the judicial system. Good morning, sir. Good morning. What is the role, what is the significance, what is the importance of the independence of the judiciary? Well, the independence of the judiciary is important because in a democracy, it is very significant and it's very vital that individual judges and the judiciary itself are impartial. And the independence or the concept of independence has its rationale in this, that those who appear before a court, the public, must have confidence that their cases will be decided fairly. And when we say fairly, we mean just based on the evidence and the law that applies to the evidence or the issues in, in the case. You, you would find that this independence, there's a push onto this independence and it may come from various sources. Um, it may come from the executive. It may come from pressure groups. It may come from the media. And uh, why it is important that the judiciary remains independent is because you want it to be said in all instances that every case that appears or that comes before a court is decided in accordance with the law and in accordance with the evidence. And this is even more important and this becomes even more acute in today's society where you find that there are disputes arising between individuals and, and the state and it has increased over the years and it is my view that the, there's a now even greater responsibility for there to be independence of the judiciary so that the citizens can feel safe and secure into what is happening with the judiciary. No, you said you said safe and secure. They can feel safe and secure. Yeah. We also spoke about confidence. This is this harks back to conversations that we've had about the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service as well. Yes. How important is it that there is that confidence that independence is there in actuality, but it also seems to be there? That is very important, and it's important because there is the concept of actual independence and there's also the concept of the appearance of independence and apart from being actually independent there must always be that semblance of independence because there is the old saying that justice must not only be done but it must be seen to be done and this independence is rooted in our system and it goes back to their various cases on it um, ex parte pinochet Seems was one of the, the, the leading cases on, on that concept of just the appearance also of independence where a member of a panel which was um, deciding an issue was a member of one of the pressure groups or one of the groups that was in the case and the entire case was had to be heard before a new panel because that member of the panel who decided the matter had something to do with one of the parties that was before the court. So that is how important it is that there's the appearance of in independence and, and the test is always the reasonable well-informed observer on the bus to Port of Spain will look at this and say look here there's no bias and there's impartiality on the part of the judiciary or on the part of the judicial officer and on that note I am screaming to ask you Go about on. the uh, the process of having some of these injunctions assigned to a judge but I will not ask about please, it please because, please do not ask because me. it's so fresh and well, there's, there's some judgments that, that, I ha that I have, but I haven't finished going through them. Uh, so, and uh, in addition to being fresh, uh, there are appeals and stuff, and it's before the courts. So I, I, I think I'll leave it alone, air on the side of caution you, for a moment. You, you have erred very sagaciously on, on, on the side of caution but in this regard, regard. But with regard to pressure groups, people lobbying uh, for certain judgments or, or for causes that they hold there, uh, democracy is messy. What is the role of these pressure groups and their interactions with the, the judiciary? Because yes, people would want to put forward their case and make sure that people, well, their issues are on the front burner. Yes. So how do they do that and the judiciary does what it's, it is supposed to do? Well, the judiciary has taken an oath and 
this this oath stems from the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, which is the supreme law. That's that's the first issue. Additionally, Trinidad and Tobago does not exist in a vacuum, and that is what I think sometimes we we, we tend not to understand when pressure is put on certain institutions, and in my view, um, illegitimate pressure. What happens is that the protection of the judicial independence is something that has been recognized by the United Nations. Um, if you look at the United Nations, the UN basic principles on the independence of the judiciary, um, this was endorsed, I think, in 1985 and 1990. And there is the Bangalore principles of judicial conduct in 2003, which is a complement to the UN principles. And the main thrust of it is that the judicial independence is a prerequisite, a substrata for the rule of law. And if that is eroded, then the rule of law is eroded thereafter. And uh, there are similar statements of principles coming out of the Latimer House principles of 1998, to which, mind you, we are signatories. So Trinidad and Tobago has signed up to these principles. So then what you have is this pressure and then this construct which Trinidad and Tobago has vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution and international obligations, you have Section 137, which entrenches the judiciary or which creates, tells you the circumstances under which you can have a removal of a judge from office. And it is a very, very high standard. So when you look at the, the calls that have been coming from some quarters. You have to view those calls in the context of the constitutional framework and the oath taken by the individual judges. But would, the, would this apparent rise in litigation, the injunctions, the calls left and right, we're seeing it in the news all the time, would this be democracy at its finest in terms of like there being the opportunity for people to have, to bring their cases for all their issues forward in the courts? Well. If you just look at what recent events, you can see that the judiciary, in my view, this is a perfect example of a well-functioning judiciary. There were applications made. They were dealt with expeditiously. There was an appeal that was dealt with expeditiously. And there were rulings. Now the system takes its course, and whoever is aggrieved has the next step of action, which is to go to the Privy Council. But what you had was a challenge, and, and, and it was by no means um, a, a minor challenge, but it was dealt with by a judge at first instance. That challenge, or the issues, were overturned by the Court of Appeal, and that is the system working. No one can say it didn't work. Not all the parties would be pleased with the results, but what you have is the system, and then he, whoever is displeased, would take it to the next step, which the judicial system allows for, and that is to the Privy Council. Well, I asked about the role of these systems and these results that we're getting yes. in the context of forming precedents that we would that we would now basically adhere to on a national level. Yes. Because signing something that is international is one thing, but looking at how it applies to the local context may be something else. And I always give the example of someone doing a a test to be self-administered abroad, yes. and blue is supposed to have some, some, some connotation or some meaning, yes. but not knowing the, con the context that blue in Trinidad and Tobago might be used to ward off Maljo, so that may skew the results. Yes. So in terms of like making the, bringing, bringing that middle ground and saying, okay, well, there's this understanding that we can use this and bring it to our local context. How do we go about doing that? Well, we start with the Constitution and what it says. And the Constitution entrenches the judiciary, and that is done for a reason. The reason is, is that you must have a very high standard when you call for the removal of the of judges, members of the judiciary, and that is because we know that pressures will be brought upon it. Now in this, in the instant, I know you, where we can refer to it, the, the, the latest incarnation of this what I call pressure. You have to view it in the context of what has transpired. Here's the context. There was um, a petition. There was um, a convening of a meeting of the Law Association. Am I correct? There, there was a vote. There was 
a decision taken because of the vote, so there was a result. Yes, and what it is is that now there's a call because of that vote, mind you, for the limiting of, of office of the GLSC of the Chief Justice. Yes? That has to be viewed in the context of how legitimately, because the word legitimacy is being used, but legitimacy finds its way in the Constitution, Section 137, and no one has put forward any view that says that any members of the GLSC, which has a different um, provision for removal, but the, it's a very high standard also, or the sitting Honorable Chief Justice, has crossed that line. So what has to happen now? The pressure is being brought from a group. The votes were 200. So let's say it's a, it, it is a legitimate decision of the um, outcome of the Law Association. But the Honorable Chief Justice has to remember his oath. And his oath and Section 137 says that, look here, in spite of pressure or whatever happens, you must adhere to your oath. He must also look at the precedent, what, what is what we are setting now. So every time a sitting judicial officer has an attack, which has nothing to do with the constitutional construct which guides his conduct, his or her conduct, you must say, well, you, there is no, and here the calls are coming from very phrases that are very nebulous phrases, lack of moral authority, um, lack of legitimacy. Where is the lack of moral authority and the lack of legitimacy? Well, you pin it, you pin that to section 137. And once it is established that that section 137, that that threshold has not been crossed, then my view is that there's an onus on sitting judicial officers to stand firm and say, no, I will not, I will not accept this pressure because the pressure is not legitimate. And then there becomes, there, there's an onus now on that officer to remain there. Well, that begs the question, how much of it is law? How much of it is subjective? Because one of the things that we've heard, apart from saying specifically yes. uh, it is about the case or the issue with Marseille's Caesar, yes. uh, that there was no apology, beg pardon. So is, so, so, is, so, is it, so is it something that is so subjective? Or is it a matter of communication? Or do we look and see what is entrenched? You keep using the word entrenched, enshrined yes. within the law, within the Constitution. Let us take it for what you have just said here. So there is no apology. Is that a reason to call for resignation? And, and what will be the basis of the apology? We are forgetting that in this um, scenario, one of the major protagonists says, look here, I did not disclose the extent of my part hoods. And there's been nothing in the public domain to disavow that statement. So what is, where is the need to apologize? So let us, but let us give that line of thought its full benefit and say that there was a need to apologize and there was no apology. We don't admit it, but we say, let, let that go. I don't at all think that there was a need for an apology. Then what happens? Because you do not apologize, that means that you have no moral authority and you lack legitimacy. Let's look at the other aspect. Well, there was an indication there was no due diligence, wasn't there? There's, there is out there in the public domain, not yet contradicted, the fact that the question was asked and an answer was given. Is not due diligence? You ask, you address the issue. What they're saying now is, look here, you must go one step further and go and check. So go and pull up all the, all the records and check the word of someone who you take that word to be high because it's, a, it's not someone that has come off the street. They've already passed through all the prerequisite tests, all the background tests. I am saying, when you look at that, where is the, and we, we use the word threshold because there is a threshold. Where is the egregious offense that creates this? I, I want to say this to, to you, that the recent happenings have caused me to, to reflect a lot on things in Trinidad and Tobago, things and where we are. I want to use the, the all-encompassing phrase of things. And I feel that this discussion needs voices, whatever their views are, to be brought to the table, and I'm glad that I am bringing my voice to the table for this reason, and, and I may be totally wrong. So I, I would concede that I may be, I just, got to, just get it totally wrong. Pick between the ears, yes? But when the role is called up yonder, 
you know that song? I used to be, I used to go to pilgrimages with my grandmother. I tell you, this, this situation has made me think about things in the country. When we go to pilgrimages and we are coming home on the bus, we used to sing songs, old songs. And one of them was when the roll is called up yonder. Well, I want it to be said that when this was happening in Trinidad and Tobago, that my views were heard, be it right or wrong, and I was there. Because what is happening here, when you look at the unprecedented pre-action protocol letters, the unprecedented court action, it is the pinata effect, in my view. You know what's the pinata effect? You have a pinata at a party, yes? And every child comes up and takes a hit at the pinata. To me, the judiciary, and in fact, the Chief Justice, the JLS, he did a pinata. And one day somebody comes and they take a hit at it. And somebody else comes and takes another hit at it, and you get another pre-action with the hope that when the last child comes up, the pinata bursts. That's my respectful view. We take a short break. We have more questions for Mr. Scotland, but you need to stay tuned to find out what they are. Stay tuned. Welcome back to a Good Morning Trinidad and Tobago. Keith Scotland has graciously agreed to stay over a little while. We still have some questions for him. Now, I want to jump over from uh, what you ended with on the break to this section or this segment. We just had a question. Yes. If the last child breaks the pinata, are we ready? I, I don't think that, that we have thought this through to, to the, the, the end. And maybe, maybe others have and understand what, what the end result um, they, they, they intend to, to achieve. But I, I say it's, it's, it's a very bad precedent that will be set if, if there is an acquiescence by, by GLS, even, even the Chief Justice, where the, the, the facts reveal, it reveals that something went wrong, you know, because we're not saying it isn't, but he did nothing that is so egregiously wrong. And I've outlined the circumstances to you before. I, do, I don't want to go it over. You know that there was an admission, that there was an inquiry, so there, and then there is our section 137, which ought to be always in the forefront of, of these officers. And I say that it is a bad precedent, and I don't think that we are ready when, when that, if, if that pinata bursts. Do you think this is just consistent with everything that uh, else that we're seeing? Uh, we're looking at the role of contract or the significance of contract employee, uh, the unions would call it precarious employment yes. in Trinidad and Tobago. And it seems as though no one's position is really as safe as it used to be. So is this just par for the course? It, it cannot be, be par for the course. And as you take me away now from that to the area of, con of contract employment, employment law, one, one, of, my, one of my very, yes, it's, it's a pet peeve, it's, it's a passion that I have. That that is rather unfair, isn't it? That that you would have persons who are supposed to be permanent on contract. So in other words, you cannot plan your life. Remember, your work is what links you to society. Yes. So you would go into employment. You would give your most productive years, but you what you will live on three year, three year contract. So when you move away the three year, three years, you, you get an appointment for over 14, 15 years, and what you will see that is an employment on contract. There's a case of Ulrich Tudor, which went all the way to the Court of Appeal that deals with that matter. And the Court of Appeal then, back then, I think sometime in 1988, I think it was Justice of Appeal de Zille said that, you know, people plan their lives around their employment. And if there is a contract, it must not be indeterminate. They must have a starter period and an end period. And beyond a certain time, there's a legitimate expectation for workers to claim that they are now permanent. And I think that the phenomenon that is, if it is a phenomenon, you say it is, that is coming to the fore of these contract employment and contract labor is not in keeping with the principles and practices of good industrial relations. But you say that, but as far as nine years ago, uh, mm -hmm. I remember being on an arrangement and it was described as permanent part-time. So there would be a break in tenure, and which made, and I see, I see you shaking your head, so, so that it, it makes it much easier to get certain things done as well as have less benefits 
And um, you, you, you cannot, you cannot plan your life like that because there's no security of tenure. And I, I think that people need to, to come to both employers, and when I say people, like I got to say the, the parties, employers and employees. If someone is permanent, if, if the, the very essence of the employment is permanent, make them permanent. Why would you continue in a three-year, three-year contract? When do you go to courts with, with a letter to, or to standards or to American stores and say, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm on a three-year contract, but let, let me take something for five years. Or you go to the bank to get a loan for a house, and you say, well, you know, my employment starts in 2017 but ends in 2020. What will the bank tell you? No, what happens in 2021? Where would we get our money from? Because there's no guarantee that your contract will be renewed because the, the employer will come and say, well, effluxion of time, contract is out. I think that if it's a position, if it's a case that workers are, let's say, on the establishment, so there's an organizational chart, workers on the establishment, why would you put that as contract labor? But it seems as though there are many decisions that have been taken around the world. Brexit is one, and people are saying that they weren't as informed as they think they should have been, yes. so they actually voted on something else. And we are seeing that kind of trend. Uh, do you think that this is something that can be happening here? And how much awareness do we need of what is going on? Because it seems as though uh, the role, maybe if the role was called right now, yes. not as many voices would be on that register. You, you would hear loud voices, for sure. I, I see that my, my reference to the role is called up beyond that has resonated with yes, you. Well, former church boy as well. Well, what I would say is this, that it is program like these where people come to air their views, and, and, I, and I say that I just may be wrong in my view. I, I, I would concede that. But I must let my view be heard, and I have given my view, and I've showed you the foundation. I've just not said accept my view. I've referred to the various sections of the Constitution. You may be surprised to know who signed, um, the, the parties with, who would have signed that Latimer Declaration, you know. You must go and check it. When, when you find out who signed it, it's the 1998 Declaration on behalf of Trinidad and Tobago. You must come back and tell me. Because these things, people must... must they must make themselves aware of what is going on in the country and what is happening now. Remember our democracy, we are developing, but you're not hearing voices, you're not hearing informed opinion. People seem to be going about their daily hustle and bustle and understanding what is going on. I think it's time that every member, no matter what your view is of our society, stand up and let their voice be heard about what is going on here, you know. But one voice that apparently we're hearing now is Marcia Thorpe, who says that her name was on a ballot, but she's not a member of the JLSC. Would, uh, you, would you care to speak to that? Well, then I am sure. I mean, you mean Marjorie Thorpe? Yes. Marjorie Thorpe. Um, that is something that Ms. Thorpe will, will, will have to take up. And, and it, it may tell you, here is the thing. All right, let, let me use this example and then... I really would want not to say much more. Okay. So there's a question of due diligence on the part of the JLSC and the Chief Justice, correct? That they didn't check when, you know, they were told X. The members who raised that petition, whoever it is, couldn't check to see who were the, the, the parties that were supposed to be there and it was not Marjorie Thorpe. So what do you say to them? Resign, you have lacked the moral authority because you put a wrong name on it because they got it wrong. Marjorie Thorpe wasn't there, correct? It's a different person, I think, is Ms. Manchu or something like that. Am I correct? Okay. So what do you do now? What do you say? You've lost the moral authority. There's no legitimacy in, in the petition. Come on. Well, where, where are we really at, at at this stage? That is not being said. So you hold others to a higher standard. I, have rest, I, I rest my case on that regard. And, and with that in mind, should the Chief Justice make a statement? No. I, I think that the Honorable Chief Justice has said, well, there have been releases coming out of the judiciary and the and, and GLSC. Make a statement about what now? Well, what else is there to say? I think that the, and I am no advisor to anyone, but I think that the Honorable Chief Justice should go about the business of the country, what the country has put him there to do in charge of the judiciary and do the work. Remember when we came the last time I told you of the appointments, judicial officers, legal officers, there's, a, there's lots to be done in this country. Sit and make, his, make judgments 
and not at all take what is going on here in order to have the, the office as a lame duck office. Keith Scotland, thank you very much, and we thank you for tuning in. This is Good Morning Trinidad and Tobago.